This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. Click the Fight TV link on WrestlingMayhemShow.com to support this show and watch pro wrestling, MMA, boxing, and so much more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash WrestlingMayhemShow. Hey guys, Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here in the Sorgatron Media Studios in the Beachview neighborhood of Pittsburgh, PA, live on the internet. And coming to you is the Indie Mayhem Show, where we talk to people in and around indie wrestling in the Pittsburgh area, actually everywhere that we can get our hands on. But lately, a lot of people, well, we're in driving distance. Uh, so it works out really well. Uh, myself, a video producer here in the Pittsburgh area with the IWC, RWA, and IndieWrestling.us and other projects. And uh, you can check out everything, of course, at WrestlingMayhemShow.com. This and other shows around all kinds of aspects of pro wrestling, as well as uh, you can subscribe to Indie Mayhem Show on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Google Play Podcasts, as well as the video versions on the Wrestling Mayhem Show YouTube and Facebook pages. And keep on that Facebook page for a live streams and events of anybody coming up so you can see who, who's, who we're going to be chatting with, and you can become part of that as well. Thank you, of course, to our Patreon supporters. You can support the Wrestling Mayhem Show Network at patreon.com slash Show and drop us a line if you have any co- questions on or, or suggestions for anybody we should talk to at goodtimes at wrestlingmayhemshow.com on, on the email or 412-206-WMS0. I almost gave you my business number. Uh, we got a, a, a guest that's a long time coming. Somebody has been on the, on the get list for couple of years for me now and uh somebody who who was at the very first indie wrestling show that uh that uh i got to see way back in the day shirley doe joining us hello <laughs> i was surprised to see my face up the monitor. hello everybody. there you go it just popped up right yeah uh <clears throat> so so shirley doe um first question kind of a break the ice kind of thing sure and we talked about a lot of it on Wrestling Mayhem Show about your kind of history with wrestling yeah. as a kid. What is your first memory of pro wrestling? Uh, my parents used to go to church at 530 uh, on Saturdays, which is funny when you think about where I've gone to being the devil worshiper that I am. Um, but we would go to church and my parents would get ready. And we'd get ready before them and 22 in Pittsburgh would play the old WWF shows. This is around like 77, 78, right when the name changed. It happened right around there. And the first match I remember seeing was uh, Tony Gurria and Larry Zbysko against the Samoans losing the tag belts to the Samoans. And my brother and I were like super into it. So what would happen is we would get totally dressed for church. And then whenever the commercials would come on, we would just annihilate each other. Like, that was the bell, <laughs> the bell that rang. <clears throat> and my parents had no what, idea this was happening because they were in the shower. Were you just ready. enacting everything that you had just witnessed? Uh, yeah, pretty much. And like, I, I kind of realized that like, from a young age, I wanted to be a heel. Like, I mm-hmm. didn't ever. I just always just wanted to just always be attacking. Do you know what I mean? And uh, so then uh, we got really into it, and we weren't allowed to watch wrestling. I grew up with my parents are great, but they're very hippie parents. Like, I wasn't allowed to have guns yet. I've grown up like the biggest G.I. Joe fan ever. Do you know what I mean? So all these things, like so parents, if you want your kids to not do something, you know, there's don't use that psychology. Evidence. So anyway, uh, so we were really into it. And I remember it was 1980, the December 31st, 1979, going into 1980 was a Saturday night. Mm-hmm. My parents said, it's a new decade. You kids can watch anything you want tonight. It was like one in the morning. Like, <laughs> not, we not, do- wait, wait, not based on your age, but yeah. it's a new decade. Yeah, I, I don't know where this came from. I think they were drunk. <laughs> I mean, it was New Year's <laughs> Eve, right? And we said, well... I heard from some kids in school that WOR has wrestling on at 1 a.m. on Saturday nights. I'm like, okay, we can watch that. And like about 15 minutes into it, I'm like, this is too violent for you boys. And I was like, the Sergeant Slaughter's coming on next. I'm like, how do you know who that is? And I'm like, ooh, okay. So we already knew who everybody was. Mm -hmm. By that point, this is like pre-Hogan. So 80 to 82, we were super, super, super into wrestling. With like Slaughter was a big deal. And then I talked about it earlier. Like Pittsburgh was blessed. I should say hashtag blessed. I feel like a rev. Uh, the, we got a lot of different shows because, like, uh, the NWA was running around Youngstown, mm-hmm. and Memphis was running in Youngstown too, which was crazy. So Channel Twenty Seven wow. in Youngstown would show Memphis wrestling at two in the morning on Sunday nights, 
So this is pretty. This is around. This is eighty two to eighty four. Probably. Oh man, so I because I got twenty seven where I was. Yeah, oh, I had yeah. no idea. Yeah, and so we would. My my parents are very permissive. They would let <laughs> us st- go to sleep early and then wake up to watch Memphis wrestling at two in the morning. By that point, after an hour and a half of Lance Russell, we were ready to kill somebody. We were like <laughs> bouncing off the like Jeff Gaylord is amazing. This is probably like eighty six. Um. So. Uh, and then, you know, we got all the other shows. Oh, sorry. We got all the other shows that were here, like Pro Wrestling This Week, mm-hmm. Mid-South, the UWF. And we were really super, super into world class because uh, my brother liked the Von Erics, which I couldn't stand. I was more Bruce Brody, which was like my first, like, wow, like, you know, this is amazing. Then we got super into Tiger Mask and super into Dynamite Kid and started getting tapes even before the 90s were up. So we've been like super weird Japanese marks since then. And then, so yeah, it was just like, it just snowballed. And then at one point I remember my parents just started taking us to shows and Youngstown would get like the sea level shows the at Struthers Field House um, or the Beagley Center. Struthers Field House. I don't know, did you ever go to a show there? It was awesome because there was riots all the time. Like there was like Jeez. fans would fight wrestlers all the time. And it was, that's where they would send the young guys. So like I remember we saw Warriors first run. We saw Tom McGee, who was the guy that was supposed to replace Hogan. We saw him work uh, a run of shows there. Um, just tons of guys, but the guys that would headline there, like maybe boss man as a baby face would headline. That's who mm-hmm. you'd get. Do you know I mean that level of guys? Wow. But I remember Tony Gria did a, did a match. And I remember my mom came unglued when Tony Gria came out. Like she loved Tony Gria just screaming for him. And, uh, and I was like, wow, wrestling can do this. they like, my mom's a very sedate person. Yeah. And it's like wrestling can do this. And then I, the other big problem was like growing up, I was like, uh, I got, uh, I, I hear about bullying now. I'm like, bullying made me who I am for better or worse. And, uh, I, I got beat up every, literally every day, uh, of school. I, to the point where like, I remember one time I was like, well, I was, I went to church all the time. I'm like Jesus said, turn the other cheek. So I would literally turn the other cheek and just get hit in the other side of the head. So I would literally at that point start to pretend that I was a jobber just trying to make people look good when they beat me up. So like wrestling got me through that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Wow. I, cause, I mean, and this is, you know, an age where, you know, wrestling wasn't, you know, openly yeah. what it is, right? Yeah. So, so, but you, you, you kind of caught that, right? Yeah. And I kind of realized that it, when I realized it was, we went, the first live show I went to was in, I want to say either 81 or 82 at the Golden Dome. Mm-hmm. And the main event was Morocco against Bob Backlund was for the title. So that should tell you like, kind of the era it was. And uh, I remember no one ever kicked out of the tombstone, the Hawaiian hammer he was doing. I have to show you too. So, and um, <laughs> I'm a wrestler. You, this is how you call me. Like, you do this. Uh, so, and I'd never seen anybody kick out of it because all it was was you know enhancement squash matches. And uh, when Backlund kicked out, I literally lost my voice. I had to go to speech therapy for like six weeks in school. They gave me this watch that you had to turn every time you wanted to scream. Because uh, I sc- literally screamed because I was so upset that Bob Backlund won. Because I love Morocco. Because he was a big fat like like guy like me, and I was like, if that guy can do it. I can do this. And so I remember you know, as a chubby kid and I just loved him. And then, uh, yeah. So like, I realized at that point, like, wow, all these other matches on TV, those are just tune ups or those are just, you know, mm-hmm. the real matches that was the back in the day, the pre-internet days. It's like, well, there were two schools of thought, like the big matches are real or WWF's fake mm-hmm. and NWA is real because of how much tighter they were. Like, we were young and we were dumb. We didn't, you know, we didn't know. Um, but yeah, I think and that's how I got through it. So like a big part of that, of getting beaten up in school is like the original Shirley Doe character was based on that. It was like 90% of my life where it was a kid that got abused constantly until one day he just snapped and killed another kid. Mm -hmm. And I was in a mental institution for all this time and a T black and white TV raised me and gave me my values. And that's how I became who I was. Like that's, was the initial idea for Shirley Doe. (laughs) How do you explain that to a crowd while you're wrestling? I don't know, (laughs) but but I always like to have a backstory for who I am. So at least I know who it is. Mm -hmm. And like, I follow that Raven school of thought where it's like 80% of the characters to me. So like that beat up kid that finally had enough and kind of went evil, like, and kind of turned his back on morality and stuff like that's pretty much me. I want to get back to the character, but, but how, how did you kind of roll from fandom to, I want to get into the ring and, yeah. and finding that path in the age that you did? I think it, the interesting thing was about that time. Hopefully it's interesting for people listening is, it was a lot harder to get in. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, I can tell you three or four schools here. Back then there weren't any schools. There wasn't anywhere to go. And um, I was just going to shows all the time. Like if I could find a show, I'd go. I remember seeing Shane Douglas and uh, Cactus wrestle in an armory in Newcastle and talking to Cactus about it. And this is I was still in college, maybe 90, 90, 91. And then uh, it was right when he finished his first run 
with Kevin Sullivan and stuff in, in WCW. So been around that time. Um, and then I just, I couldn't figure out how to get into it. And I always thought back then I was about 5'10", 175. And like, that was small for wrestling today. I, you know, be big in the, it's big size for the Indies. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just couldn't find anything. I started doing a lot of artwork for promotions and my brother and I actually started setting up chairs when we were in high school for shows to get to be part of shows. Like when they would run like the shows, Rob, you mentioned before, like when they run in Elwood city and stuff, like we would always go and set up the ring and we'd set up, I remember a gentleman, Joe, one of the guys who was a manager around here, we'd always volunteer to do stuff or get stuff for the wrestlers just as we wanted to be a part of it. We didn't know how to get into it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, steel city started running and we knew norm connors from going to the shows and we'd always hang out with them at shows we used to cosplay it's embarrassing now but we used to like make whole outfits this is God, like 88 89 90 um it shows so he knew us and he'd always talk to us and he'd hey, run a promotion i'm pretty good he kept telling me back in the day he was always trying to get terry funk on a show which was a big deal to me the funks are a huge deal to me um and uh finally I did the first Steel City logo, and he said, "Well, I don't have any money to pay you. This is this is not an indictment of him. This is just this is wrestling, right?" He's like, "But I don't have the money to pay you. But have you ever thought about being a wrestler?" Because I was already doing a after getting like beat up my whole childhood. I decided to really get super into martial arts. Mm -hmm. I had a heart murmur growing up, so I couldn't do any sports till I was about eighteen when it closed up. And then at that point, I finally had stamina and had wind and could do things. I got super into hockey, super into martial arts, really physical stuff, and uh, I was doing that and. I, he set me up with someone. There's a guy, Benson Lee, that came here from LA. He trained at Gill's Garage, where it's like Louis Piccoli trained there, Superboy, like a lot of the luchadors of the LA area trained there. And he was out here and there was no one to wrestle, no one who could do that style. He goes, Do you know anything about lucha? I'm like, Yeah, I'm like kind of obsessed with it. So he said, Well, he'll teach you lucha and you can work him on my shows and that'll be your payment for doing this. He also taught me how to do MMA. So I did like five MMA fights around that pre like whatever this is now. And the rules were basically you could slap someone in the face, which is the worst idea. Do you know what I mean? It was just like, you could get mad, but not throw punches. You could just slap. It was like Pancras style rules. And, uh, and then, uh, so he trained me and he actually trained my brother trained. My brother wrestled his battle monkey for about a year. And the first year he wrestled, he reacted 250 in the PWI 500. A fact that he never lets me forget because I was like 474. And, and, and I want to I point I want to yeah. point out like there there's there's a thing going out right now on the internet like this past week yeah. about like people complaining about not getting into the PWI. Yeah, <laughs> it was a bigger deal back then because there wasn't an internet, so it was a. Right. Do you know what I mean it was a good way? That's of how getting, you learned about people, and that's how you learned, and that was how you you would say to promoters, "Well, I'm in I'm in the 500." Mm -hmm. Like, does that mean anything? I don't know. But, you know, it was somebody noticed. Yeah, somebody noticed. And like, but it, again, it's all, all like a, it's a very political contest of, you know, how you get in. Joe Dombrowski was really good the last couple of years. Like he would send everybody in mm -hmm. and he would really do it for a while. I, remember, I don't know if he still does it or not, but he was awesome at doing that, and making sure they got the right info and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, when I was young, PWI was the biggest thing in the world to me. Do you know what I mean? Like when mm -hmm. the year end issues would come out, my brother and I would just. I would have to, because again, I told before, my brother has trouble reading, so I would read the Peter Bay issues to him verbatim, like just sit there and read and talk through them. And, and for those that haven't haven't uh, watched the other uh, shows that we do with you here, like uh, your brother had dyslexia. Yeah, we think, so. yeah, because he's just, it's funny because he ended up, you know, he was a vice president of Major League Baseball for a while, like of their ticketing and stuff. He's done some like really mm -hmm. high level jobs. But yeah, he's kind of like taught himself how to communicate without really needing to learn how to read. Like hmm. he can read, he just it's just really hard for him. Yeah. So like he learned pretty much how to read from GI Joe comics and uh, wrestling. So we met Larry Hama, who wrote GI Joe a couple years ago, and told him that, and he was like, "That's crazy." Like, I, so I'm sure you hear it all the time because yeah, but it still means something when yeah. you know when I yeah. hear it. So uh, yeah, so Norm got me in, and then I would wrestle his shows. My fr I just talked about some the other day. My first match was 22 years ago last weekend. It was August 20 or two weeks ago. August 22nd, 1995 was my first match. It was in Newcastle with my trainer. And I was like seventh on the show. And it was like, I shouldn't be seventh. I shouldn't even be first. You know what I mean? Why am I even mm -hmm. on the show? I've been training for the first year I trained. I wasn't allowed in the ring. We had to learn how to do all the lockups and stuff because he was just really tough on us. I had to learn how to do, <laughs> it just probably came in healthy later, handy later. I had to learn how to bump and stuff on like uh, on pads or like on concrete mm -hmm. and like learn how to take bumps on wood and stuff and then when i was in the ring the ring was like super light and um so then and, uh, and those outside bumps are nothing to yeah you now, probably. that's the thing now it's like 
if you learn how to bump that way, it sounds like kind of like Jackie Chan, like drunken master stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like, but it was, it was a lot of that stuff. Like, like I remember one of my drills was literally like just run around the ring a hundred times. Like, okay. Like, what am I going to learn from this? Like, it doesn't matter. Like you're going to lock up. We were talking the other day about, uh, John Bowen was telling me when I was training, he's like, do you remember that day we made that kid lock up for like two hours? And I was like, yeah, cause now he knows how to lock up. Do you know what I mean? It was like a lot of that. kind. Of, that's how I learned. Mm-hmm. And he would take me to shows and I would just get stretched by guys. He'd be like, take this kid in here and just beat him up. Okay. And but that's how you learned back then. And you kind of had to get accepted. But then the thing I learned after my trainer stopped wrestling, maybe after my fifth or sixth match, and I only knew Lucha. So I knew everything from the opposite side of the body. Mm-hmm. I knew how to work the left side of the body. And when I would wrestle anybody that actually knew what they were doing, I didn't know how to switch sides. So I had to teach myself everything backwards. How do you start working the right side of the body? So then I started uh, going to PWX's uh, training nights and got beat up a lot, which is I deserved it. I'm sure I was young and stupid. And then finally got on to shows. And I had been wrestling as Masahiro Panic back then. I was doing a gimmick. I wanted to be uh, Masahiro Chono. He was like my hero growing up. And uh, I loved New Japan a lot. And he was like the, you know, like the G1. He won all the G1s back then. So my whole style was Masahiro Chono. Like I did all his stuff. And was, I remember, um, who's the guy that ran Ohio Valley? The uh, he the Fed you see him when he was anyway. I remember I worked at a show one time as Master Panic, and I remember I was I wrestled Ricky Morton on it, and I remember I was really excited about my match. He goes, "Yeah," he goes, "You're all right." He goes, "But everybody hears this Japanese name, and they see this fat Dago kid come out." <laughs> and he goes, "It just doesn't work." And I was like, "Oh, okay." So I had to figure out what do I do. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So they had a guy there named uh, John Doe. And they wanted me to be his crazier brother. And this kid was like, he was good. He's come out in a body bag and it would scare people. And like, but they wanted me to be his brother from the mental institution. And I was like, well, I can do crazy pretty easy. And I was like, I'll just do this gimmick for a couple shows and then I'll get to do my real gimmick and I'll get over doing my real gimmick. Mm -hmm. So I've been working a bunch of places doing it and had been, nobody was really doing Lucha back then or knew. And like, I knew how to do all the base stuff. Like psychosis was kind of like what I based myself on. Like I could do a couple top rope things, but mostly I was really good at catching guys and not a lot of guys were doing dives or anything or high spots really then. And then, um, I don't know, it just like clicked and I stayed there for a while and then, and being Shirley Doe forever. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like it's been what, 20 years, probably 21 years of doing the gimmick. So it just, uh, it just the name clicked and that was a long reaching story of like one question. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. But that's like, that's how I got into it. And it was just like, it kind of like, I always knew I wanted to do it. I remember my mom asked me, I was watching a Dynamite Kid match. She said, you can do whatever you want when you grow up. And today, to this day, she's like, I should have never said that. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, you look at me now. I think uh, one time she was talking to Mick Foley at a show. Because I used to do, that's the other way I got in, is I used to do all his gear. Um, like all the shirts he wore in ECW, like the airbrush shirts and stuff. Mm-hmm. I did all those, like the Dungeon of Doom one, uh, the, the, ter- the Terry Funk, you know, um, the Brody and Hanson one together. He wore for one of the barbed wire matches. Like he would always say, "Hey, can you make me a jacket? Can you make me a shirt?" Because I airbrushed and did did that kind of stuff. So, um, so I knew him. I remember one time he said to my mom, "He's like, I, I really wish your son had had a different hero growing up than me." He's like, "Because he's gonna get bad dad." And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm an idiot." But you know, I just like that style. I like the the. I got really super into uh, FMW in Japan and like the. It's like the Memphis style, but like the really super hardcore stuff. Yeah. And, um, is that where the like the fully funk stuff? The IWA that you'd is where that came That's IWA. Okay. Yeah, that was a spinoff like from there. But like FMW is where like, Anita wrestled, and um, I remember seeing the first Anita match. She had like a swimming pool surrounded by bombs that went off, and dudes fell into the water, and barbed wire all around the ring, and like light tubes and all this Jeez. stuff. And I was like. I was like, holy, this is where I want to be. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, like I talked to G Ray about it, and people are always like, people always say, you know, we're crazy. And it's like, it's a very same thing to us, mm-hmm. where it's just like, well, yeah, that's that's art. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, it's uh, it, it's like a violent performance art. <laughs> yeah, it is, and that's why I've always taken wrestling. It's an mm-hmm. art form, and that's always my excuse for why. Well, why do you do this? And there's not a lot of money in it, or there's mm-hmm. you know not a lot of respect. It's like, well, it's art, and like I am devoted to my art. It's like Dr. Jerry Graham said, it's all blood, guts, and thunder. That's what I always think wrestling is. Like that phrase always, I think about that before I go to the ring of him saying that and how like wrestling is like the most perfect thing in the world. And it is like, it's, there's nothing, there's no drug high that ever gets you as high as being in front of a crowd and working and uh, telling a story. Like it's, it's getting like, cause that's why I'm a writer in my other life. Uh, and it's like, 
telling stories is what I love. So it's it's a cool thing. I don't have any better way of putting it. I get like really emotional about wrestling sometimes. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I, I kind of, you know, like I said, I love having you on here because like I've always wanted to uh, have a conversation with you. Uh, but but the, my earliest memory of you was our first uh, uh, show in, in IWC, being introduced to independent wrestling. Yeah, and I remember you stuck out to me because uh, you had just had a War Games match. Uh huh. And you were coming out with an eye patch. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I remember the uh, uh, some other people that may run a promotion now were were going around and handing out these ping pong balls. Yeah. And I think it was the night that that they threw eyeballs at you. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that was the thing. Like I, we were trying to think of a way to end the war games match. Yeah. And I always loved the way that the best I quit match to me has always been Magnum and Tully. Mm-hmm. And I was I was the first, one of the first NWA matches I ever saw, mm-hmm. and I remember seeing it. And like coming from the WWF world of the safe, even there was a little bit of blood, and there they had done like you know a couple of street fights and stuff, but rare blood. And they would put the X on the screen when it happened. But to go from that to Magnum putting a stick in Tolly's eye and Magnum being upset at himself at what he'd done, it was a totally different world. Mm-hmm. And then once you got into Brody and the other stuff, like man, this is and this, and this stuff wasn't happening in the mid two thousands, really. Yeah. And uh, so the finish we were trying to think of is like, if I've run roughshod over this company for a year and a half, Mm -hmm. I need to get put out. So Sterling had like a sword cane. So that was the finish. Corey Graves. uh, That was the finish where he literally put it in my eye and I wouldn't give up. And they made me give up. Mm -hmm. And my eye got taken out. So I thought, well, I needed to have like show that, that that did something to me because I hate cage matches where nobody bleeds. And I hate when I like when somebody gets hurt by something and it changes their story. And plus, like, I always wanted to be Nick Fury when I was a kid. <laughs> so, like, when I was a little kid, I would, like, dream of having an eye patch. Like, I would have think I should take, or, like, or, like, the Six Million Dollar Man, how he had the fake eye. I always wanted a fake eye as a kid. I don't know why. And uh, so I thought, well, it would be cool to do the eye patch. And then finally, the goal of that before I left was the goal of that was I was going to become, like, a faith healer. And mm-hmm. I was going to, like, heal myself and then start healing other heals. And, like, do you know what I mean? Just be an over the top religious zealot. Like, go from the crazy devil side to all the way to the other side. And be kind of like Ernest Angley, where he like heal people, and he'd be like, "You just see him, he would like just hit people, and he would like heal them and stuff." He still does it now. He's like ninety four, and they have to like prop him up, and he he does it. But like I thought that would be a cool like not brother love, but like just like kind of like Jim Jonesy kind of crazy thing. It just didn't end up happening. So. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so that's cool. I'm glad I stood out. <laughs> um, I know Chad, you were in those shows at those shows with us as well um so so when you know we've done a lot of interviews here uh, on this show and uh you're you're a name that always comes up as, as a trainer mm-hmm. and and you uh, i believe what the uh it was a coalition of competition at the yeah. time um tell us a little bit about getting involved on that side of things and and of course there's a lot of people that have come out of your school of, of note yeah um i had started training we talked about joe perry a little bit earlier mm-hmm. he had a ring in penn hills and I was like maybe th- three years in and I was like, I wrote, he's like, I want you to come out and see some of these guys. Like I, I don't, I think a couple of them have potential. And I'm like, look, I really don't want to teach. Cause mm-hmm. I always feel like when do you, when are you good enough to teach? It's, it's a weird thing. Do you know what I mean? And there's so many fly by night people and I didn't want to be one of those people, but I went out and double Budokan and hentai were wrestling each other. And I was like shocked how good these guys were. And they'd had no formal training whatsoever. Just watching stuff on TV. And I remember I was thinking, man, I was so used to meeting like kids at backyard kind of kids that already had an attitude and neither one of them had an attitude. They were both just like, we want like, we would like you to teach us like, please teach us. And like, those are my first two students. And like, you couldn't have had two better students like ever. Do you know what I mean? And, um, I was really happy with how that went. And then I was, IWC had gotten so many requests to have people that people wanted to train people would ask where school was because that's what happens at shows mm-hmm. and i remember norm said to me he's like you should really think about doing this you did a good job with those guys and i was like uh do you know what i mean like it was like do i am i really good enough do you know what i mean to do this but uh we you know i jumped in i guess with both feet and did it i'm really happy with uh i'm really proud of i have so many students it's hard to remember all of them do you know what i mean of like the people that are out there there's at one point i know in iwc that like 75 percent of the roster was guys that i trained you know what I mean? And like, that's a really good feeling. And, uh, I think you, the thing I really pushed though, was I hated seeing the kids would come out of a school in six weeks or six months even. So like I did the same way that I learned, like you weren't allowed to hit the ropes for six months. You're 
weren't allowed to do strikes for a year. Like, and I lucked out on a lot of guys like Gory and uh, DJ Z Shima. Like, I got those guys when they were 15. So I had them for three years. Like, they couldn't mm-hmm. work anywhere until they were 18. And they were both really patient and learned a lot. But to both, again, just like Devil and um, Hentai, like, the first time I saw those guys get into tryouts, like, DJ Z already knew how to wrestle. Like, I didn't really teach him. I taught him, like, how to take bumps. Mm-hmm. and like how to like psychology and how to a little can, bit of can, stuff kind of molded what he already yeah, knew about, but right? he already i mean if i had, he would have made it anyway do you know what i mean mm-hmm. and like uh elias samson's the same way like he the first time i met him he's like he i think the only thing i really did for him is like he would just ask me questions all the time i remember when uh, instant messenger where everybody was on instant messenger back in the day I, I worked at this one ad agency downtown and like half my day was him asking me questions like well how do i do this how do i do that and like uh he was really smart he still is, you know what I mean? But just ask a million questions. Mm-hmm. And like, I could always tell if somebody came into my school and they were like, I'm going to be the best wrestler you've ever had. They were going to be the shits. And, but if they were really humble and quiet, Jimmy DeMarco is another one. I remember he came in and the first thing he said to me was like, I did medical research so that I could earn enough money. For yeah. This. He's told that story on, <clears throat> on wrestling Mayhem show. And I remember being like, well, for, I've had so many people screw me over on money. First off. Awesome. That I'm going to make money. Yeah. And second, I'm like, all right, this kid's like really dedicated. Mm-hmm. He's a little touched, but in a good way. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I love and, him. So. And also hearing hearing that that he was a quiet and you know reserved. Yeah. Well, that's know. what I think I like about him is like the people. I remember I wrestled a show for one of my friends in Kentucky's retirement shows, and when I got there, I looked like this, and I have glasses, and I have my laptop, and I'm sitting in the corner doing work and then the guy the promoter said i was really worried because i heard all these stories about you (laughs) and he goes and then you're out there and i got in a kid's face because the kid was walking around during a match and i made the kid leave the building and made his parents leave too and uh the dad wanted to fight me and uh took a swing at me and i was curious i pulled him back he's like you get out there and you're just like nuts i'm like yeah it's because you have to have this dichotomy Mm. of like who you are like wrestling i hate whenever i hear people say like yeah i I really didn't feel it tonight or like you know let's not take any bumps tonight it's like wrestling to me and this is the same way in teaching i look for these people who have the same attitude as me the 10 minutes 20 minutes that you're in the ring is the culmination of your entire life of being a fan of wanting to be a wrestler and, and going for it and if you don't give everything you should be willing to die every time you go in the ring you know what i mean you should be one to take care of the people you're in with but you should go in with the fact that it's like i'm going to give everything i have and there's been times where i've felt sick i haven't felt like doing it but you have to go in and do it and if i could find that quality in my students and a lot of times you find it by Again, making them do lockups a hundred times. Like nobody wants to do lock. I don't want to do lockups a hundred times. I don't want to do body slams a hundred times. But it made me better as well because it was more of the mechanics. Like how do you learn the mechanics of actually wrestling? How do you the repeti- the mind memory, muscle memory of repetition and stuff? So finding the people that were willing to do it and weren't willing to quit, and then uh, willing to work hard is, is like really important. So I'm I'm really proud of, of all the ones that have done stuff. But so many of them, again, I'll forget one and they'll be upset. But like so many of them, like they were. They had it in in themselves, and my job was to take that raw material, hone it, so that they could go out. I always said, like, I can teach you the words, but I can't teach you how to speak. Mm-hmm. So I'm giving you the the language of wrestling, and you have to figure out your accent. You have to figure out how you talk, and you have to figure out who you are. Like, I hate whenever I meet people in training schools now, and they're like, "Oh, this is my gimmick." I'm like, "You've never even taken a bump yet, and you have a gimmick." Like, that's like way like yeah, it's cool to have a thought about it, mm-hmm. but that's way down the road. Like, let's learn how to how to mat wrestle and let's learn how to do it like the right way that's a, it drives me nuts watching wrestling now where guys don't work the ring properly guys don't put headlocks on properly first round of the may young classic there was a girl that had a headlock on completely backwards and it was like how did this get on tv mm-hmm. and it was just especially with wwe yeah like, and it's like yeah it's like uh, we were taught if someone's in the wrong position on a headlock like when i first broke in drop them on their head and like they'll figure it out either they're gonna get hurt and they'll never wrestle again so much old wrestling is like that like you know like when you hear hogan saying like yeah they broke my leg and then i came back we, we, we were talking about that i i can't remember if it was on the last show or, or off air but you, you talked about like being mean is the broken leg of yeah. this era yeah and we can't be as i'm not as mean anymore so like for some reason when we went to ohio like, it's super mean. i don't know not <laughs> well, me but it's, well, like, it's ohio yeah and it was like another state but i would just get upset about stuff and i think it but i think more there was like more um hazing but not in a i didn't want to do hazing in a sadomachistic uh uh way where it's like a frat but more just like oh okay well these guys played this rib on me but then we'd still do nice stuff along the way so it was kind of like a mixed message maybe see what i mean like oh you get a free porn magazine on the way home for putting up with all this i don't know we used to go to this place the uh, lion's den 
And it was like, it's like this. Cause when you go from right. Cincinnati out there, it's the only place that's open all night. So like you're yeah. exhausted from coming back from Cincinnati. Like, well, we got to stop the Lions then. Exit 189. Uh, is, is what exit it is on 70. And uh, you would, I remember we and, would. And new sponsor of the show now. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but we would go in there and I remember like, I I remember uh, one time I was traveling to Cincinnati with my ex-wife. She's like, we should stop here. That place looks crazy. And I'm like, cool. I'm like, I've never been here before. I walked in and literally didn't ask me my ID and they knew my name. And I was like, shit, we've been here a lot of times. So I also set <laughs> off a wall of vibrators that time, which is the worst thing. If you ever see a vibrator that says, try me, don't try it. Cause it will activate all the other vibrators on the wall. And then the whole wall will come down. So that's not a wrestling lesson. That's just a life lesson. I hope somebody picks it up properly. Next time you're in a porn store. Yeah. Um, so just don't go. Or, or yeah. Yeah. But I think that's the thing is like, I didn't want to be like, I'd see a lot of people that would um, just beat guys up and grind guys out and stretch them. And there is a place for some of that. But on the other hand, it's like, I think it was more about fun and more about how do you learn that camaraderie of being on the road? And like, I think that's one of the problems now is like so many, I'm glad when I see guys like Sean Phoenix is doing it now. Um, and like Remy's doing it, a few other guys, Beastman does it, where they're getting on the road and working outside shows because that's when we started to learn about wrestling. And when we would go into other territories and be in other places, it was like we were on top or we would be higher on the top than we were here. Or we would get treated maybe a little different than here, or we would work guys that we would never get a chance to work. Mm -hmm. And then we would learn that stuff. And then just the camaraderie of basically being like little brothers fucking with each other on the road, that's like the most fun thing in wrestling. I still like, I have so many goofy stories. Like Dirk Sigler one time he was playing, uh, an, there was like these plastic guitars, like at this truck stop and he was playing back in black on it. And, uh, he just picked up and just smashed it when he was done right in front of this trucker. He was just like the who just like smashing this guitar, walked up and threw it on the counter and paid for it. And I was like, who would do something like that? Do you know what I mean? That's what's awesome about wrestling is you get to be around these like goofy personalities and kind of live this life that I'd never get to do half the stuff or have half the confidence that I do myself if I hadn't been a wrestler, which mm. is like a beautiful thing. I think it's always been interesting. I, I always kind of say like, you know, people with a certain kind of, uh, mindset or maybe you can say damage gets yeah. into something like this, right? Yeah. There's nobody, like I always say, like, we're not well adjusted. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like someone said to me, like, you would have become an accountant otherwise. Yeah. Like I mean, there's something in you that makes you like what person wants to go, like people always say, well, it's kind of being a rock star, isn't it? I'm like, no, like I think Cabana said this to me. We were talking about it once where it was like, you're driving at three in the morning. You don't know where you are, but you're driving back home. You're on some back roads. You're exhausted. You got beat up. Maybe you got a sandwich. If there was somewhere open, do you know what I mean? All the rest of your friends are out getting laid, drinking, doing stuff. And here you are in a car with four smelly guys. That's mm -hmm. wrestling. But if you can make that fun and then it's the moments I always joke that I should make a wrestling video game that is like 90% of the game is driving and it's like driving with a concussion and it's driving, not get paid. Do we have enough gas to get there? And then you get to do a two minute match. It's, it, it's the old desert bust game. It's the right? Penn and Teller game. Yeah. Yeah. Penn and Teller. yeah. 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 And like, that's all it is. And it's just like, you're stuck playing that forever. And like, to me, that's what wrestling, but then those, but those moments of highs make up for all the other stuff. And then when you're in there, it's like you said, it's like, well, what part, what normal person, like I, I was looking at a chair once and I got hit with after the match, after the adrenaline wears off and the chair had like a giant scoop out of it where my head was. And I'm like, well, what kind of person like sober, not adrenaline out, right? Um, not in the heat of battle and not being, you know, I have to get in this mindset and like switch my mind to this, this weird it takes a long time to explain. Well, you, you explained earlier when you when you when you're heading out there, you're just ready to break everything. Well, it's, I believe I, I read this thing in. Um, it sounds well. I'll tell you anyway. Uh, there's this thing in one of the uh, Anton Lavey wrote about from the Church of Satan, this werewolf ritual, where it's literally that you have to become someone better than yourself to accomplish these amazing tasks. So how could I get hit in the head with this metal chair and laugh at it and just keep getting up and maybe not even selling it, like not bumping for it. And it's like, cause I have to become somebody else. So literally when I put my makeup on and when I close my eyes, I literally say to myself, when I open my eyes and I walk through this curtain, I'm not me anymore. And I don't have the day to day problems of me. And I'm not worried about, am I going to make the rent? Am I going to, you know, how's my job going? I'm just going to be this person whose only desire is the fight. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, and it's like a total mindset shift. And it's like, a, it's kind of like a chaos magic ritual thing, but that's like, it's a little deep and scary. But anyway, it's like, you know, you have to become somebody else. And like, that's where the makeup comes from. Cause it's kind of like the, 
like the new Thor movie kind of has some of the, the Viking part of it where it's like, like putting the magic on your face, like doing that and going out. Like I love that part of it, like the ritual of it and then getting out there because then you have to make it special every time. Like it mm-hmm. has to, because I think about that. There's times where you're like, shit's going wrong in your life and maybe you don't, you would rather be somewhere else. But then you think like when I was 10, did someone, if I knew that I was going to have this opportunity, even one opportunity, even one match. So like every match is important. And, and like to, to go through that and get excited about it, that's, that's awesome. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And even now, like I don't, I, I wish BC Steel said, said to young guys, you should write a journal of all your matches. And I wish I'd done that. Like I know he, uh, hero does that. Like, cause he, for a while he was still posting them before he got hired uh, and he can't do posts and stuff as much anymore, but he used to like write every single one of them down. I'm like, dude, how do you do, how do you remember? He's like, I was writing down a notebook after every match. I'm like, shit, I wish I'd done that. And I was doing it for a while. And then I just like, when we were working in Ohio, we were working so much. And it was like, you know, I don't forget your question, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, I don't know. I wish I'd kept records because I, it's, it'd be neat to see all the, and definitely it's not, it's not like, like, you know, doing all these matches, it's not like they're kind of kept, you know, yeah. who knows who's filming it if they're being filmed. Yeah. You know, it's, we joke all the time. It's like the, the best stuff we ever did was when we first started and there was 50 people like IWC shows when the first IWC shows were at the Emerald room in McKee's rocks, this little tiny crappy place. And like, then we got into a couple bigger places, but we do shows in front of 50 to hundred people. And like, even like when they ran CCAC was their first kind of big building. I remember there's one Texas death match, a hand time I did now, maybe a hundred people there and more than half of them didn't give a shit. You know what I mean? But we did. And you know what I mean? Like the finish was him doing a double knee stop off the top onto my legs covered with chairs like it was the dumbest move like there's no way to do it safe do you know what i mean like we're both gonna get hurt we did another match where he gave me a tombstone off the apron like and i'm like well who would do that like through a table do you know what i mean and and um but we would joke it's like finally when the crowds start coming we're like oh we did all our it's like the early ufc guys that were like oh we did all our matches before people caught on to what it was but like that was the beauty of it like you know i i have tapes or videotapes and no vcr to show them do you know what I mean? And and at some point, like I just stopped taping stuff because I was like, well, I'm never gonna. I don't like watching it because I pick it apart. But like, it would be neat at some point to be like, oh yeah, I've been here, here, and here. Or I've done this. So, mm-hmm. but, and so, but then sometimes stuff in your head is either better or worse than it is. So maybe it's better to kind of move on in, in your head of, of, of how stuff was. It's, a bit, it's better to have those shaped memories, maybe. Yeah, it's it's always like it's more poetic in your head, maybe. But it is cool when it matches up to it. That's a really good feeling. Like when you see stuff like that cage match, you were saying like it, it matched up. Mm-hmm. So like there was stuff in there. Like that was a really fun match. Cause it was like, I have like different thoughts on story structure and wrestling. And that match was all ECW where it was like, this match isn't about a single move. This match is about a collection of, can you top this stuff? Mm-hmm. And everybody has to top each thing until the end. of. And it was a crazy collection of people. Cause if I recall, like, like abyss was part of it. Yeah. And of course, during James Keenan, Corey Graves, uh, Dennis Gregory, I think was a part of it. Yeah, Danny, and, and uh, Dean was in it. Uh, Dean, Dean Radford. Yeah. Hentai, uh, Sebastian dark CJ sensation was reffing. He did a big dive onto us at mm. one point. Yeah. That was a crazy match. I remember first time I wrestled abyss was in Canton, Ohio. And I was all excited to wrestle him. Right. Cause I've been watching, as we talked about before, I watched a lot of TNA, right? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, but, to, 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 to a certain detriment, but yes. But uh, of all the badness of the early TNA, Abyss was like a bright spot. Like he always had like really, like I thought really intelligent matches and put together really good. He did he did the kind of style I like where it's a combination of like all Japan big spot finishes with like a lot of false finishes mixed mm-hmm. in with hardcore stuff, which is like what FMW style kind of is. So like I always like recognize like, I'm like, I know that if, we worked each other. We would have a lot of fun. And like, and that's like, those are the kind of guys I seek out. And I like, I want to wrestle. So someone, this one promoter was like, yeah, well I'll pay you four fifty to come to Canton. I was like, okay, I'm not worth $450. So I know that this whole thing is a giant scam, but if I get to wrestle abyss, that's cool. So I, I did. And our first match, it was a thumbtack, uh, thumbtack barbed wire casket match. And I remember getting in the locker. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah. Thumbtack barbed wire casket match. Yeah. Are the, ca- are the thumbtacks in the casket? No, or? no, they were just in the ring. Just there. As soon as it started, there wasn't like, the, they put them out when we came out. And like, I remember he and I were talking in back. He's like, so we'll do a big spot. I'll pull up thumbtacks. That would get a pop. Yeah, cool. And we get in the ring and he's already, and he's like, the thumbtacks are already in the ring. Like, the fucking idiot runs this show. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, all the, like, so, and it, we couldn't lock up. Like, how do you lock up in that match? Like, yeah. how do you, you just have to start, we basically had to come out and just start drilling each other. 
and it's like so we looked at i said to him we were in back i'm like well this is the last match of a feud that we never had so just go out and do whatever the blow up would be because we're never we may never wrestle each other again it was fun like it was a, it was an interesting match i remember i took like a choke slam off the top through like two open chairs that was a big bump i wanted to take and then i took the black hole into the casket which was fun and then like so it was like everybody's all freaked out because it was a real casket they used to use in a funeral home and like back then i was working like 90 hours a week in advertising so i just took a nap like once they put me in the casket i like just went to sleep so they wheeled me in back and he opened up to see if i was okay and i was snoring and he's like did i i thought i killed you and i'm like no no it was fine it was a great bump and he was like, why'd you go to sleep? I'm like, when do I get to take a nap? Like, this is a great time to take a nap. It was comfy in there. Probably, yeah, it was right? super comfy. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it has to be comfy. You're going to spend eternity in it, right? So um, we get there. And so we get back and the promoter's gone, of course. He left. And none of our money. And like, I was more worried about him because he's a, you know, he's a name. Yeah. And so he's like, well, let's go find his promoter. So we went to the promoter's house, his parents' house. And the parents had no idea that the guy was running a wrestling show. Imagine both of us like covered in thumbtack marks, barbed wire, didn't take a shower, just show up on your porch. And this is a big guy. A big guy. That's the thing is like, so when we came to the ring, like in back, like, nicest guy mm -hmm. in the world. I don't want to kill this guy, like, but, you know what I mean? but then when the mask hey, is on. Joseph Park. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. You see what he looks like as Joseph Park and no one yeah. had seen that yet. Yeah. So when you meet that side of him, he is, that's who he is. He's super sweet. But when the mask is on the chain and you're standing there and you're like, shit, this is a monster that is going to be stiff and made about five minutes, you know? So it was kind of intimidating, but awesome in that way. So I love challenge. Mm -hmm. So then we're on this guy's porch and like, we don't know where our son is. You know what I mean? Our son, he, I guess he went to Florida. So he just left with all the money. So we didn't know what to do. Like we really had the cops with us. The cops drove us to his house. So none of us got paid. He eventually found the guy in Florida, like years later, like found his address and went to the guy's house and waited for him to his money. It was like two years later. I just remember I was so mad I grabbed a can of paint and threw it in the locker room. But I, I, who did it help? It didn't help anybody. I was just destructive and young. But I just remember being so mad. And like Canton's not a short distance. Mm -hmm. But I should have known better. But at least I got to wrestle him. So there's like, and I got that goofy story out of it. So, you know. That's awesome. Um, so, well, you know, obviously we talked a little bit about May Young Classic and things. What are you watching today? What's kind of got your attention or any wrestlers out there or, yeah. or anything in particular? Local or, or no, wherever. Oh, man. So, I watch a lot of uh, like I've been doing a lot. Doesn't look like it, but I've been working hard on cardio, and so I've been. The trick is is you watch a lot of wrestling at the gym, and you don't realize how long cardio is. Mm -hmm. So um, been watching a lot of G. I watched almost all G one this year, which is like literally like I don't think there's ever been a better tournament in the world ever. Like the mix of talent and the different matches and stuff, and there were guys wrestling each other that. Like I love when style clashes happen to see what happened out of them. And you had guys like Zach, Zach Sabre Jr. was in it, who's amazing. And uh, like uh, Minoru Suzuki, who's the greatest, one of the greatest ever. And you had all these guys that are like top level Japanese guys, but also, you know, like, you know, the Bullet Club guys. There's such a mix of guys. And I love the way G1's always set up where you don't know who's going to win. And everybody wrestles everybody. So you get to see a whole month's worth of, of like really big matchups. So I watch that. I watch a lot of Lucha which I always have. Um, I like to keep up on that. Any hardcore stuff I usually keep up on too, just just to watch. And then um, I was watching 205 Live, uh, but I stopped watching that. And I was watching NXT. And NXT went from being this like really special thing to watch all the time, especially even when it was Florida. I was watching it because I had a bunch of friends down there. And then gradually, like it's just hard to watch now. It's very – the more polished it's become, like it felt like a lot of times like, well, why? I can't believe they're, they're putting this on TV mm -hmm. is how it felt before. And now it feels like it's it's safe for me right now, which is that's inevitably what happens with things. Um, but I still like my favorite thing in wrestling now is like I like we have a both at Rise where I wrestle in Collinsville for Brandon K, which is a great promotion. Mm -hmm. um, they have uh, it's in an old movie theater, so there's a whole area where just to watch the matches, which is awesome. And uh, so I watch all the matches there, and I take notes, and like I really like I love that part of it. And then um, also. Uh, PWX, we have a room now to watch. So I watch a lot of stuff. So I really like seeing a lot of guys. So there's a lot of really good talent around here. And like, there's some things that I think younger wrestlers need to work on, but like, there's still a lot of guys that really have a lot of heart. Mm -hmm. so there's like Lee that wrestles for us is, is awesome. Uh, Lee Moriarty. Yeah, Lee Moriarty. Like that kid, he reminds me of uh, DJ Z when he was young. Because like, it's funny. Like, I remember all the times I would talk to him when I first talked to him, he was like, I don't know if he was shy or I don't know, maybe I'm a maniac. He would just smile. 
Say hi, thank you. He, he was amazed because uh, he's another one of those that you see his character. Yeah. And then he was sitting here, and I was just like, I thought he talked more. You no, know? no. And, and he's a I, I, he's an awesome dude. Yeah. You know, but he's very quiet. Yeah, yeah. And but he's great. And I remember the first time I saw him wrestle, I'm like, oh, he's doing all this British fall stuff because I love British wrestling. Like, mm-hmm. like um, like I remember uh, I went to Japan. I wanted to learn all this stuff. My second tour. And there are all these battle arts guys on the show, which is like this weird promotion that mixes lucha with, with MMA. So it's like a crazy. And I'm like, well, maybe I can learn some new stuff off these guys. Like, oh, we heard you do British style wrestling. I'm like, yeah. Like, teach it to me. I'm like, I don't want to teach you how to learn stuff. <laughs> so it was like teaching all the goofy Johnny Saint moves to them. Like, Johnny Saint's like amazing. Um, but yeah, Lee's awesome. Um, like, they don't wrestle the PWS anymore, but they do it rise. Like, uh, Duke and. Um, Locked and loaded guys. Uh, Gannon. Gannon, yeah. I'm really bad with names because I'm getting old and, and I had a lot of concussions. Uh, those guys are great. And they both really get wrestling, which is really important to me. Like, they're really smart. See, so we, we, we were kind of amazed because they came in here uh, last week and yeah. they were dressed up. Yeah. That's yeah. what I love about them. Like, it, it, it was the best dressed, like, guests we've ever had yeah. on the show. We don't ask for it. Nobody else is doing it. It's funny. My wife hates most wrestlers she meets and she's like, I love that dude. He's such a nice guy. And yeah, she loved yeah. him right away. She's like, he's, and I mean, he is, he's great. And, um, man, I, this is hard. Cause like every time I start talking about young guys, it's hard. You know what I mean? Cause I'm like, Oh, I ignored that guy. Beast man's awesome. Like he's my favorite tag partner I ever had. Um, I love beast a lot. And, um, um, I think who else? And, Be- and beast man, for those that maybe don't know lo- lo- local yeah. stuff, like it, it kind of has this caveman character to him. Yeah um and it, i've had a lot of fun watching him over the years yeah he's across promotions i i'm kind of hoping that as he gets to travel on the road and do more stuff he's really smart because he knows when not to do stuff which is a lot harder um than when to do stuff mm-hmm. do you know what i mean um let me think else. i have to look up my phone because i wrote down notes because i'm like oh who else do i talk about uh, I talked about Remy before. I really like him a lot. He's really smart. Remy yeah. Uh, Derek Direction told me to mention him in a shout out, but he's awesome. He's like another guy. Like there's a lot of the young guys. I'm like, oh, I, I know I'd have a good match with him. So I have to wrestle him someday. Mm-hmm. I really like his gimmick and he's, he's a goofball. Mm-hmm. And um, he came with him. He came the whole way up from Cleveland to see my band play once, which was like ridiculous. I'm like, why would you try the whole way up for the, just this? He's like, Oh, I just want to hang out. So he's awesome. Uh, Matt Connard's awesome. He's my favorite. He and Beast are my two favorite guys here. I think Matt's like the most underrated guy. And um, he's just so good at so many different things and so solid. Um, yeah, he's awesome. Lewis, who, I don't know if you've seen that kid at Russell's PWX yet. He does like the nerd kind of gimmick. Yep. yep. He's a million times better than his gimmick. Like, he's going to be really good like because he changes stuff up and does different stuff. Mm-hmm. But his gimmick's awesome too, but I really like him. And then there's a lot of older guys like Brandon K. still awesome. Like, like I got to, I'd never got to do singles with him and I got to do one with him this year and it was like super easy, you know, uh, like Kato's doing really cool with his gimmick there. And, uh, there's just so many guys like, that's what I like now is like, there's a really good mix of stuff. I'm having, um, a really good time, uh, in my current feud too, uh, with Peyton Graham. Um, you know, I hate him and I should talk about how much I want to kill him. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, that's a blast. Like I like when I finally get in a feud with someone that's as physical as me here. What is the best and the worst thing about indie wrestling? I think you've answered a couple of those questions <laughs> along the way here. I think the, the worst thing is that, um, nobody learns lessons from the past. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's like, but it's the same problem in any wrestling. Like at the point where, like when Hogan was first in power in WWF in 84, and there was the question of, you know, if they were going to unionize, that would have been the time to do it. Do you know what I mean? And the fact is, like, I don't think a lot of indie wrestlers realize that the power rests in the wrestlers that are on the shows. Yeah, there's always going to be another 20 bodies to fill out a show. But how do you make yourself special and how do you become a draw and how do you you have to like stand up for yourself? And that doesn't happen a lot. So there's a lot of downside of that. And then the best part of it is just that it's awesome that people get to do matches and we get to do this in front of fans like on this level. And that, and also seeing people like like DJZ and, and that that start here and get to go somewhere like that's really awesome. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, for all the bad, it's always say like once you go through all that. I said before you go through that hours of shit to get to that like ten minutes of heaven. Like yeah, that's mm-hmm. cool. You know, it's it's better than a lot of people get. You know what I mean? It's better than any other job I've ever had. It's not really a job. I love when guys are like I'm retiring from wrestling. Like well, you can't really retire from a hobby. You know, it's like retiring from you can't retire from stamp collecting. You have to like make money to make this a, something you retire from. 
So guys in WWE you get to retire. You get to just not wrestle anymore. You get to go do something else. Yeah, you get to maybe do something. Like, oh, I always joke. I'm like, I'm going into miniature golf after this because, you know, like, what sport will I tackle after this? <laughs> Curling. There you go. I can't do it. My back's too messed up. I can't sweep anymore. Like, seriously, sweeping and, like, cat litter crush my back. Like, I can take table bumps, all sorts of stuff, but when it comes to, like, that repetitive motion, I'm just doing it there, no. That's why you get a tens unit. You like plug it into your back and like shock yourself. That's all I got here today. Like I had to do, I do like that <laughs> cupping thing. Cause I heard Eugene Nagata does it where they literally put hot cups on your back. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I do. And like, you like take all the toxins out of your back. So you had the cup to get here today. I have a, I have a machine that does it just this week. Cause like, um, just the last match was pretty, pretty tough. Okay. Like DDT on the street. Um, which is a fun bump. Oh, geez. Yeah. That was great because everybody's like, oh, why would you do that? I'm like, why wouldn't I do that? It was probably harder for, it's hard on both of us. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, but I mean, I know these matches are going to get a lot more physical. So like, I've been really trying to keep my back. I've been doing a lot more stretching and a lot more core working out and stuff. But yeah, I think my back's, you can't wrestle for 20 years and not have a bad back. You know what I mean? It was like, mm-hmm. uh, I had a Labor Day party this week and it was like, uh, Troy Lords and Hentai and Denny Gregory and me were all sitting in the corner and it was all like the walking wounded talking about like, well, I can't really walk as my sciatic does this. I can do all this. Like, well, how's your sciatic? And it was just like, you know, the perils of being old men. <laughs> That's um, amazing. And yeah. then just the visual alone. Um, of course we mentioned you're wrestling still regularly at PWX and yeah. rise in the greater, greater Pittsburgh area. Yep. I guess we can say mostly South of town here. Yeah. Um, where else anybody can check you out, uh, online or, or anywhere else. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of stuff online. Go ahead. Sorry to be pluggy. I do a movie, a movie site. It's B and S about movies.com. It's if you ever want to know way too much about Italian sex, sex murder movies, like Giallo, they're called. Um, they're like, kind of like if you take an Alfred Hitchcock movie and put like way too much Satanism and drugs and, and murder and stuff in them. Like it's those kind of movies or movies you've never heard of. Um, a lot of horror stuff. I'm really into that stuff. My wife and I do it and we do a podcast too, which is not as high tech as this. This is amazing. And then uh, I'm in a band, uh, camppgh.bandcamp.com. You can check us out, uh, doom metal band. And then um, come see PWX shows. Like I love when people come out or come to Rise or PWX. Rise, I'll be starting eventually. I've just been helping out there and helping in the back. But PWX, other than this next show, I'm every show. I also forgot Facade's also awesome that I trained. He's really good. <laughs> He's in because he may be watching this in India. Who knows? He told me, I, I was like, he's like, hey, I'm going to India for a while. Why would you do that? But, you know, if he's happy, he's getting to wrestle in Japan, which is awesome. Yeah, and, and, and he's training people in India? Yeah, is yeah. that the case? I've been, yeah. I've been watching his Instagram, and it's been Yeah, tremendous. at their training center. They have, like, a training school there, and he's training guys. And he's I know he's going to Japan for two days because mm-hmm. the guy who's my agent in Japan runs shows uh, in Nagoya. And it's crazy in Japan. Like, outside of New Japan, guys, if you want to use – it's they like, you can literally fu- – it's so much easier to get guys to be on your shows. So you can be like, oh, yeah, I want to get, like, uh, a sushi and to be on my show. Cool, here's how much he is. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's like really easy to find guys to get. Wow. Them. So like, uh, we were on one show with him the first tour I did and it was like Dino. I don't know if you're, did you ever see Dino when he wrestled in IWC? Is he the one that put Gory's head in his pants and yes. gave him a pile driver? Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like Dino, a bunch of dudes from, uh, that did battle arts, which is like somewhat big group and a couple of DDT guys. And uh, like Kudo was there when he, cause he was in IWC for a bit. Yeah. And then, um, this guy, Ultraman Taro, who was like a big FMW guy back in the day. So imagine the fattest Ultraman you've ever seen. <laughs> and he wrestled Dino in like a gay versus Ultraman match. Which was the main event. And Glenn Spector went with me too. So that was a crazy tour. That was my first tour of Japan. It was like 11 matches in 14 days. Oh, wow. We didn't even get to this. We might have to have you back to talk oh, about gosh. Japan trips. <laughs> yeah, it's a blast. Like the, it's like, it's crazy. I have so many messed up stories about Japan that. I can probably legally tell now. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, do I have a, I'll tell you quick, super quick. Okay. A little teaser. Um, so the first night we wrestled, um, I had to like, I thought that, um, cause I taught their school for a couple of days. I thought, well, I'm going to get to do a regular match. Mm-hmm. They took all the ropes down. It was like barbed wire, light tubes, all this stuff. So I was all bloody, no showers, nothing. And I'm like, well, where are we going to stay? And they're like, well, first we're going to eat. And they brought out this giant metal pot. It was like a like fire under it, and they cooked stew like next to the ring. And where my brother was like, because he went with me, he's like, "Fuck this! I'm not eating any of this fucking stew." <laughs> so I'm eating like chakko. It's like this like stew that's supposed to like toughen you up. 
Mm. So I'm eating this and they said, well, where are we going to stay? I'm like we're going to stay at friend's house. And that's a phonetic translation for a place that you go to and you get to rent three porn movies and you get to stay there for the night. If you get the porn movies, because the way that it works there is like everybody lives in the same house. Wait, 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 wait. So this is like the Japanese version of how you used to do pay-per-views. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. got you. So yeah. you're used to this idea. Yeah. hundred percent used to it, but nobody else other than me spoke enough Japanese to know what was going on. So we go in and they're like, you need to rent three movies. And people are like, we're on, I'm jet lagged. Like, why do I need to get movies? Well, we can stay here all night if you rent movies. And, like, well, yeah, porn movies. and I'm like, well, yeah. So I didn't want to get any, right? I just like, because I know Jap- the story of Japanese. Like, they blur everything out and they're all just very boring by comparison. So I, and my brother's, my brother's like, look, because I was married at the time. He's like, they're going to send a prostitute to you if you don't get a, get a movie. Why would they do that? Because I, I was getting like death scenes, which is the Japanese faces of death. I'm like, mm-hmm. I'll watch that and go to sleep. Um, so so nobody else wanted to sleep there because obviously whatever bed you're sleeping in has been used by mm-hmm. numerous people. So I had all these tour shirts. So there's people in Japan that bought our shirts, that IWC shirts that I had laid on on these beds. But whatever. <laughs> so um, I couldn't think. Uh, Japan. So the, the movie that I got was just a girl getting ready for work. And it was just literally the camera following her for like four hours as she got ready for work. And that was it. I fell asleep. It's like nothing happened. It was like her brushing her teeth, her eating eggs. And it was just following her. So I said to my agent the next day, I was like, uh, Mackie, uh, what's up with this tape? He goes, oh, that's very popular in Japan. Like, because guys never get to see girls get ready. They like, it's a cultural taboo. They keep it hidden. I'm like, well, and I only know the conventions of American pornography. So I'm like, like, well, what happens when she goes to work? Like, does she sleep with her boss or like a bunch of guys? You know, like, I don't know. And he goes, no, she just goes to work and everybody's very happy. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm never watching your tapes ever. Like, this is the worst thing ever. It was like her picking out her outfit, but it was literally like a four hour tape. But I get to stay in the, in the room for free. Yeah. My brother was like, I'm not staying here. And he went to like a Lawson's, which is like the big convenience store over there. And he got food and he sat on the curb and waited till the next morning when we left. Like he would not sleep there. And it, it was just, but I was exhausted. I remember that's when, you know, like, re, like, like, oh, it sounds very romantic. You're going to wrestle in Japan. You're sitting on a bed that a bunch of dudes have used to watch porn tapes. And you're, you have wet wipes. And you're scraping out all the blood and thumbtacks and barbed wire out of your arm. I had a big piece of glass. It's like up here somewhere that I had to pull out. And I just wrapped my arm with wet wipes. And I'm like, I'm being a rock star <laughs> somewhere in Nagoya in, in, a, in a porn theater. So my we, mom's we, really we, proud. Of we're definitely, definitely bringing it back for more Jap- Japanese stories. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Was there anything else you wanted to plug while we were at it? I plugged too much already, didn't yeah. I? Thanks for having. This is really fun. Thank you so much. No, for having thanks for having uh, being on here and check them out. Shirley Doe. Uh, and uh, check out all the rest of the interviews. We got everything over at WrestlingMamShow.com. The whole feed, um, of course, on your iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, wherever you want to see podcasts, or over on the YouTube and the Facebook page. And uh, let us know if there's anybody you want to talk to or a question for anybody coming up. We got all the listings on the Facebook page uh, for Wrestling Mayhem Show. And until next time, please support Indie Wrestling. Oh. Sick, 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 you know how I act now If you got a problem, come and see if I'm a back down Act wild, steady sipping jack now This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com